In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to our study of the readings for the 20th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year B. This is the first of two videos that will cover the readings for this Sunday. The second video will cover exclusively the Gospel of John chapter 6. So let's get started with our very first video. We're walking through the first reading here. So the very first reading comes from Proverbs chapter 9. And it's always good to ask ourselves, why was this reading chosen for this particular Sunday? Because there is always a relationship between the first reading, the responsorial psalm, and also the gospel. And so look for that relationship as you go through the reading. It's often a very profound theological relationship. And so if, if one is not attentive to this, they might miss that. So let's take a look at the very first reading. It's a famous reading from Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9. It's a famous section in the book of Proverbs. And here's what it says. It says, wisdom has built her house. So just keep this in mind. So the Proverbs are accredited to King Solomon. Some scholars will say that they were actually finished about five centuries after Solomon. So there's a little bit of debate on exactly when the book was completed, but they're credited to Solomon who built the temple. And here we have this image of wisdom building a house. And why is that important? Because Solomon asked for the gift of wisdom. And this king who asked for the gift of wisdom would be the king who would build the temple. And so years later, people could reflect on this and understand that just as Solomon was given the capacity to build the temple, he had the gift of wisdom. In a similar way, wisdom has built her house and she calls each one of us to take part of this great feast. So let's read through it. It says, wisdom has built her house she has set up her seven pillars, seven pillars. Now, you see this image of pillars in a couple places. Number one, if you go to the narrative on the temple, you can look at 1 Kings chapter 6 and 1 Kings chapter 8 when the temple's dedicated. There were two very special pillars at the entrance of the temple, okay? Here you have seven pillars. And also, if you look at some, you know, you might say like older descriptions of how God created the creation, there's a lot of symbolic language, and often you'll find the image of pillars in a certain in a few places in scripture. And so wisdom has set up her seven pillars. The concept here is, you know, this is a house that's supported by seven pillars. There's seven pillars right here. And that's really interesting because when you go to Isaiah chapter 11, depending on how you read the chapter, you can come away with seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So it's been kind of a traditional understanding in the church, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And here you have seven pillars that support the house of wisdom. Verse two, it says, she has slaughtered her beast. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. So everything is being prepared for this feast. It might remind you a little bit of Psalm 23, where it talks about how the Lord sets a table before me. She has sent out her maids to call from the highest places in the town. Now, the image here, you find this image throughout the book of Proverbs. There's an invitation to all people to grow in wisdom, to know wisdom, to live their lives, which follows the wisdom of God. And so this is really beautiful, this image here. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this. And so one thing to keep in mind is that here we have the book of Proverbs. It's attributed to Solomon, who's a king. He's writing this book firstly for, for kings, for rulers, but also for the people. And so you find the wisdom of a king, which is also accessible to everyone. And so the image of she has sent out her maids to call from the highest places in the town. Everybody's being invited to receive this wisdom, to grow in this wisdom. It's not just exclusively for the king. 
Okay. And so verse four, look at what it says. Whoever is simple, let him turn. And so the concept of the simple one, it's an image of one who is easily enticed, easily drawn into sin. And so the simple one is invited to turn away from their sins. Turning is often a metaphor for repentance in the Hebrew scriptures. The simple one's being invited to turn away from sin. To him who is without sense, she says, come eat my bread and drink the wine I have mixed. And so you get the idea here. The feast is a metaphor. All are being invited to grow in wisdom, to turn away from their sinfulness and to come to this feast of wisdom. Now, what would one do if they wanted to grow in wisdom? Obviously, they would turn away from sin. Obviously, they would turn to the Lord. But if you read the book of Proverbs closely, you'll see that wisdom is found in the Torah. By studying the Torah, uh, knowing the law of God, you will grow in wisdom. So there's a relationship between wisdom and the word of God, okay? It's more than worldly wisdom. It's a wisdom that focuses on divine revelation, okay? That's very important to consider. It's 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 focusing on divine revelation. And as a matter of fact, the people of Israel could always say that their wisdom was better than Gentile wisdom. It was distinctly different than Gentile wisdom because of how it focused on divine revelation. And so one psalm that you might want to study is Psalm 19. If you go to Psalm 119, you see where this idea is very concrete. I have a video on Psalm 19. You can take a look at that if you want. But here's what it says. Wisdom is calling out and it's saying, leave simpleness and live. So turn away from your simpleness. In other words, you have to remember that simpleness here, as I said earlier, it's, it's the um, tendency to be easily deceived, easily enticed, easily drawn away into temptation and sin. And so turn away from that simpleness and focus on God's wisdom. Learn to serve the Lord, and everything in your life will change. Leave simpleness and live. Now, why does it say leave it, leave this simpleness and live? Because if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses uh, explains to Israel that he's setting before them a choice. And the choice is between life and death, between a blessing and a curse. And he says, choose life that you may live. So in Deuteronomy 28, he outlines all the blessings and curses. And then in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy, verses 15 to 19, that's when he basically says, choose life that you may live. Choose life by adhering to the Torah, by being faithful to the law of God, by following his word. Okay. And so this reflects back upon this. Leave simpleness. Turn away from that simpleness and turn towards the wisdom of God and walk in the way of insight. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. The invitation of the banquet, it's very important because in this um, Sunday, we're going to talk about the bread of life sermon. When Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And now this is amazing. You know, unless you it actually says, unless you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. John 6, 53. Now, this is amazing because, you know, just as Jesus explains the importance for us to receive the Holy Eucharist, we can look back upon this reading in Proverbs, the invitation to the banquet. And, and we can understand that the invitation to the banquet in Proverbs was more than just come and eat a bunch of food. The invitation was to truly change your life, to turn away from sin, to turn to the Lord with all your heart, to seek his wisdom, to grow in knowledge of his word. And you would feast upon wisdom. OK, and if somebody is feasting upon wisdom, they will understand the significance of John chapter six, the importance of receiving Jesus Christ, the true Passover lamb of the new and eternal covenant in the Holy 
Eucharist. So do you see the incredible relationship between the first reading, which is the invitation to a feast, how it would have been understood in its original context, uh, and really looking upon Solomon, the wise temple builder, the importance to turn away from a simpleness of life, which leads us easily into sin, and to turn towards the Lord, the Lord, to study his Torah, to study the word of God, and how that prepares us to understand the importance of the Eucharist. And it goes on, it says, therefore, this, these are my notes right here. These, these are my comments. Therefore, the Feast of Wisdom is like no other. This is, a, this is a unique feast. All are invited. And, and the image of every person being invited to the Feast of Wisdom, there's something exceptional here. Everyone, everyone's being invited, but you must turn away from your tendency to sin, your foolishness, ex, and etc. if you're going to accept this invitation. And so the prophet Isaiah speaks of the day when the Lord will destroy death forever and prepare a feast for his people. So there's really something amazing here because Isaiah, he uses an image of a feast which actually complements the feast of wisdom. The day will come when the Lord will destroy death forever and he will prepare a feast for his people. And this feast, my brothers and sisters, is what we call the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's underlined in Revelation chapter 19. And our Lord Jesus Christ, before he left this world, he established the Eucharist the Passover of the new and eternal covenant. He gave us the gift. He instituted the Eucharist. And so every time we receive the Eucharist, we receive a foretaste of our of this eternal feast that we will celebrate for all of eternity. And so Jesus uses the image of a great feast in Luke chapter 14 and Matthew chapter 22. So you can find this in Luke chapter 14, it's right around verses 15 to 24, and also Matthew 22, 1 to 14. So our Lord also picks up on this image of a great feast in two parables. And essentially, he uses the image of being invited to a feast to explain the importance of receiving the fullness of the gospel and entering into the kingdom of God. And in these parables in Luke 14, 15 to 24, Matthew 22, 1 to 14, there's also a subtle in, uh, underlining of the importance of the Holy Eucharist, okay? So you can see how this image of a great feast, it's not just in Proverbs chapter 9, but you have an image in Isaiah 25, and Jesus uses this image in uh, parables as well. So hence, those who are children of the kingdom if you're, if you're a true child of the kingdom, you will readily receive this invitation. You're not going to say something like, you know, how much sin can I get away with, be, you know, and still enter the kingdom of God. You're going to say, how much more can I give my life to Christ? That's what a true child of the kingdom will say. How much more can I do for the Lord to accept the invitation? So if you accept the invitation, you will repent of your sins. You will embrace the faith. You will believe in Christ our Lord, and believe in, in believing in him, you will become a disciple of Jesus. And as a disciple of Jesus, you will give your whole life to him. That's what you'll do if you really accept this invitation. You won't be sitting there saying, how much sin can I get away with and still enter the kingdom of God? So therefore, in a pedagogical manner, okay, um, what was true for the sons and daughters of wisdom is exceedingly true for those who are sons and daughters of the kingdom of God. So do you see there's something very pedagogical in this first reading. It's preparing us to understand the great invitation to enter the kingdom of God and especially preparing us to understand what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 6 the invitation to receive Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. And not just the invitation, but the absolute need to receive him in the Holy Eucharist. So, indeed, our Lord tells us that many come to the great feast 
But he says in the Gospels, he speaks about those who come to the feast and who are unprepared. Okay, so you also see this in the Gospels. If you go to Matthew 7, Luke 13, he talks about those who come to the great feast unprepared. Now, how would a person be unprepared to come to the feast? Well, obviously, if they are not baptized and if they have not repented of their sins, okay, then they would be unprepared. Obviously, the church teaches about a baptism of desire and a baptism of blood. In the early church, there were people who were martyred. They were in the process of being baptized. They were preparing for it, and they were martyred before they received the sacrament. And in the early church talks about how they considered them to be baptized in blood because they were martyred or baptized by desire because as they were preparing for the sacrament, they died. And so, of course, the great feast at the end of time is the marriage supper of the Lamb. You find this in Revelation chapter 19. And moreover, the banquet of wisdom has often been compared to the invitation to come to the sacred liturgy. And so every time we come to Mass, we feast on the Word of God. It's important to remember there's two distinct parts in the sacred liturgy. The liturgy of the Word, which is the first part, and the liturgy of the Eucharist, which is the second part. And so very similar to the book of Proverbs, which underlined the Feast of Wisdom, which ultimately led one to love the Torah and the Word of God, the Law of God, the Torah, the Word of God. In a similar way, if we seek to come to this feast, we will have a great love for Scripture and we will have a great love for the Eucharist. And this is something that we want to talk with people about this weekend. We want to encourage them to develop that great love for Scripture, to keep the Scriptures open at home, to read from the Scriptures every day, and to meditate on the Scriptures and take them into, into prayer in your life of prayer as you pray to read Scripture. And so, my brothers and sisters, let's go now to the next reading, okay? I just want to say one last thing before we finish this first reading. The concept of building a house is also very profound in the Hebrew Bible because it draws directly from the dynastic promise. And you're probably thinking, what is the dynastic promise? Well, the dynastic promise is the great promise where God told David that he would build a house for David and that David's son would build a house for the Lord. So the house that God would build for David, that the Lord would build for David, would be a dynasty. David would have an eternal dynasty. There would always be one of his descendants upon the throne. This promise is fulfilled in the coming of Christ, the descendant of David, who fulfills this promise for all of eternity, a descendant of David, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then also, the promise that one of David's descendants or one of his seeds would build a house for the Lord, that's fulfilled when Solomon builds the temple, okay? And so, it's, and so the concept of building a house, it looks back on this great promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. You can read through it, and as you read through it, notice the nuance on how the Lord will build a house and how Solomon will build a house, okay? And so now let's go now to our responsorial psalm. Very interestingly, it's the exact same responsorial psalm that we had from last week. It's from Psalm 34, verses 2 through 7. I'm just going to read it here for you. Sometimes the psalms, the verses are sometimes a little different, okay? And the reason why is because this you know, basically heading or superscription that you have right here. Sometimes it is numbered and other times it is not numbered. So be careful. Um, and so even the numbering of the verses might vary. And then even the Psalms themselves, their numbering might vary as well. Um, if you want to, you can look at my introduction on the Psalter, which I have on this channel the introduction on, on the 150 Psalms, and I go through this in detail. But let's go to Psalm 34. You might notice that it's the exact same Psalm that we had from 
last week. And I think that there's a reason why we're repeating the same responsorial psalm. It starts off with the very first line, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually on my mouth. I, you know, I, I, I think that you know, the concept of blessing God at all times is so important that the church wants us to see this twice to constantly be blessing the Lord and to be praising the Lord continually. Now, the, the one thing that I would say about this is that if we don't take time to read scripture, to recognize the, the works of salvation that God has done throughout all of salvation history, to recognize his work and presence in our own lives, it will be very difficult to praise the Lord, to bless the Lord at all times. But if we are constantly meditating on scripture and also continually considering the way that the Lord has worked in our lives and continues to work in our own personal life, we will always be blessing him and praising him continually. OK, so there's something very important here about being able to bless and praise God continually. There must be a continual action of reflection and thanksgiving and gratefulness that's taking place in our lives. And why is this important? Because the word Eucharist, it comes from the, from the concept of giving thanks or thanksgiving. And so if you really reflect on what we're doing when we come to the liturgy, when we come to Mass, when we come to the Eucharist, three words all describing the same thing, we're, we are a people who should be continually blessing and praising God because of what he has done through all salvation history and what he continues to do as he works in our lives. So David goes on and he says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and be glad. And if you remember the life of David, there were two different times when David was running for his life. The first was, you know, at the beginning, right after David was anointed king of Israel, right after his great victory over Goliath, Saul became so jealous of David that he wanted to kill David. So David was the innocent anointed king running for his life. The second uh, uh, point in David's life when he was a man on the run was after David committed sin uh, by having relations with Bathsheba, by putting to death her innocent husband Uriah and his companions died in that incident, second uh, Samuel chapters 11 and 12, David actually was running from his own son, Absalom, who tried to take the kingdom away from David. And so there were two different times when he was running from, from his, you could say, enemies, one who was King Saul, another who was his own son, and the Lord protected and spared David and restored him essentially. And so you can see how David is saying, you know, let the afflicted hear and be glad because David was greatly afflicted during various points of his life. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And I love this image of magnify the Lord with me because here's David, a man who really knows how God can save us from such difficult circumstances. Let us exalt his name together. And, and I love the image of you know, praising the Lord together, giving thanks and magnifying and exalting his name together, because it's like David is saying, I'm not just, I'm not just telling you, I want to give thanks with you because of what the Lord has done in my life. I sought the Lord and he answered me. Uh, and these words right here, that you, you'll find them repeated in various ways, how we turn to the Lord in prayer, how we seek his will, and how the Lord answers us and delivered me from all my foes. So here's David talking about how God has delivered him. Look to him and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. And look at what he says here. Verse 6 is one of my favorite verses in Psalm 34. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. This is David's personal testimony a poor man who cries to the Lord, who is saved from his circumstances and saved him out of his troubles. So, you know, salvation, you might want to consider that uh, in the Old Testament, there is a developed understanding of salvation. So, you know, when you read the Old Testament, 
you know, you want to be aware that the concept of salvation is developing. It could, uh, it could indicate victory. It could indicate being saved from an adverse circumstance. It could indicate that, in, that God saves you from an enemy. And so this concept is all being developed. And in the New Testament, the fullness of salvation is revealed in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead, who has triumphed over death and sin and the devil. And so it's in the victory of Jesus that we understand and receive the fullness of all salvation. And this is developing, the concept is developing throughout the Old Testament. And then finally, David says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. It could remind you of Exodus 23, 20, where the Lord promises to send his angel to guide the people of Israel on their way. And then finally, it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, tasting and seeing here, you know, it recalls the banquet imagery in Proverbs, okay? It's, it's, it essentially saying, you know, through experience, you're going to taste and see. Through the life of faith, you're going to taste and see. Through the way that you commit yourself to the Lord, you are going to taste and see. Through the way that you trust the Lord, you will taste and see. And so, so consider what the image is underlining here. And of course, when we come to the Eucharist and when we give our life to Christ completely, we taste and see the goodness of the Lord. When we come to the Eucharist and we hear the word of God, and then when we put it into practice, we taste and see. When we come to the Eucharist and we receive Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, who is truly present in the Holy Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity, we taste and see. So my brothers and sisters, now let's go to the second reading. And the second reading comes from Ephesians chapter 5. And what I want to say about this reading is it's preparing us for the end of the chapter. Because at the end of the chapter, Paul gives his advice to those who are married. He talks about marriage in Christ. And so let's look and see what he says in chapter 5. He's giving a lot of good instruction on how one could repent of their sins, turn away from the worldly things, and completely follow Jesus. So he says, look carefully then at how you walk. Now, when he talks about looking carefully at how you walk, he's talking about continual conduct. In other words, he's saying, look at how you live the faith. Look carefully at everything you're doing. This is something that we should do. We should consider how we're living the faith. We should take this to prayer. It looks back upon Psalm 1 verse 1, which talks about how the just man walks according to the law of God. And so not as unwise men, but, of, but as wise. So we want to walk in the wisdom of God, which is different than the wisdom of this world, because the wisdom of God will be guided by the word of God and also the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so he says, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So what does he mean by this? He means that, you know, we make the most of every opportunity to serve Christ, realizing that there are many temptations and challenges around us, that we're in a constant spiritual battle and a spiritual conflict. And we want to be honest about that spiritual conflict. So he says, therefore, do not be foolish. Avoid every form of foolishness. And, you know, in the church, sometimes, you know, people have great senses of humor and I think Catholics love good humor, but we want to be careful. You know, it's good to have a good sense of humor, but we also want to be careful to avoid every form of foolishness. And so he says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. So avoid drunkenness, but be filled with the Spirit. And I love this verse right here because... Um, I have often had the question from young people. They've come up to me and they have said, you know, why can't I smoke marijuana? And I'll say, well, very simple. God does not want to fill you with marijuana. He wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He doesn't want to fill you with alcohol, with evil thoughts, or with marijuana, or with any other thing that would dominate your life or distract you from the faith. 
He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that you can give yourself completely to Christ and do the will of the Father. And this is something that we want to talk about, turning away from the other, you know, pleasures of this world so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit.